people get ready there's a train a coming you don't need no baggage you just get on board all you need is faith to hear the diesel humming don't need no ticket you just thank the Lord. People get ready. There's a train to Jordan picking up passengers from coast to coast. Faith is key to open doors and for them there's hope for all among the loved the most there ain't no room for the hopeless sinner who would hurt all mankind just to save his own. Have pity on those whose choices grow thinner, so there's no hiding place from the kingdom's throne. Welcome, dear friends. Welcome to our spiritual home, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tarpon Springs. Our church is located here in the heart of the walkable Tarpon Springs Historic District and is known as the home of the Innes Paintings. And happy Father's Day to all you fathers and grandfathers here and at home. My name is Judy Lucarelli and I'm serving as worship associate today. We are a church of many welcomes, and we offer a warm welcome to all of you who have joined us. This is a liberal community for all ages, promoting spiritual growth, social justice, and the arts. As such, ours is an active church, and everyone is invited to participate in any of our activities, whether you are a member or not. To learn more about our events, our church calendar is on our website, uutarpin.org, or you can discuss activities with church members. Our children are with us during the beginning of the service at this time, and we have faith formation programming available with our gifted leader, Jamie Cruz. Children gather for the, their time together with her after the story. If you'd like more information about our programming, please contact Reverend Christina or see Jamie after the service. For those present with us in the building, we have connection cards available uh, in the pews next to the hymnals. Uh, if you fill one out and put it in the offering plate or give it to one of our greeters, we'll be able to get in touch with you. There are also small cards to write any joys or concerns that you would like to share at the end of the service, uh, either with me reading it instead of you saying it, or you can get up, if you don't want to write it down, you can get up and speak about it yourself. Please add these cards to the offering plate as well. We're delighted our own Reverend Christina is leading the service today, titled Freedom Delayed. 
Music is provided by our music director, Bonnie Whitehurst. Bonnie will be singing throughout the service, and you're welcome to sing along wearing masks during the songs and hymns. Again, welcome. We light our chalice with these words from Richard M. Fuchs. May the light of truth illumine our minds. May the spark of love set our hearts on fire. May the flame of freedom burn brightly within us, now and always. Now that we've lit our chalice, if you would turn to page 123 in the gray hymnal, we will sing Spirit of Life. Our story for today is titled, All Different Now, Juneteenth, the First Day of Freedom. It was written by Angela Johnson and illustrated by E.B. Lewis. A June morning breeze off the port blew the smell of honeysuckle past the fields, across the yard and into our room to wake us. And nobody knew as we ate a little, talked a little, and headed to the fields as the sun was rising, that soon it would be all different. Then we worked and worked and worked some more, under the hot Texas sun until word spread from the port to town through the countryside and into the fields that a Union general had read from a balcony that we were all now and forever free and things would be all different now. I watched as my Aunt Laura sang as she held her baby, Mr. Jake, who some say was a hundred, cried quietly. And a group of grown people bowed their heads and whispered things to each other I could not hear. My mama held my hand softly and looked beyond as another breeze blew over and everything fell to a hush. But later, Papa, Mama, the aunts and uncles, and all my cousins had an afternoon picnic by the water. 
My baby brother crawled around our blanket as we listened to the sounds of the waves. And as more people joined us, we ate as free people, laughed as free people, and told stories as free people on into the night. What was before would be no more. As we walked back home, the cool of the night soothed our tired feet that padded quietly past the shadowy fields of cotton. And in the morning, the smell of honeysuckle will wake me again beside my sisters and brother to a time that will be for all of us all different now. We will sing the children to their programming to the hymn number 413 in the gray hymnal. And as we do so, I will light this chalice to send them off with the love and light of this community. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the light of God surround you everywhere. doesn't take much to steam up the glasses on a day like this. Now is the time in the service where we receive our offering for the work and welfare of this church. Ours is a free faith which must sustain itself financially. Please go to our website uutarpin.org and click the donate button or you may mail your offering to the church at 57 Reed Street, Tarpon Springs, Florida, 34689. Or for those of you with us in person in the sanctuary, place your offering in the offering plates as they are passed. The offering will now gratefully be given and received. Somebody's calling my name 
justice Somebody's calling my name Oh my Lord, oh my Lord What shall I do? What shall I do? I have two readings this morning. The first is titled, An Essay on Slavery with Justification to Divine Providence that God Rules Over All Things by Jupiter Hammond, written in 1786. He was the first published African-American poet in the United States who lived his life in slavery. This piece wasn't published and was only discovered in 2013 by a graduate student. It may be the first time that slavery was defined as a sin. Theologically, Christians had long argued for slavery's compatibility with their faith. Our forefathers came from Africa tossed over the raging main to a Christian shore there to stay and not return again. Dark and dismal was the day when slavery began. All humble thoughts were put away, then slaves were made by man. When God doth please for to permit that slavery should be, it is our duty to submit till Christ shall make us free. Come let us join with one consent, with humble hearts, and say, For every sin we must repent and walk in wisdom's way. If we are free, we'll pray to God, if we are slaves the same. It's firmly fixed in his word, ye shall not pray in vain. Come, blessed Jesus, in thy love, and hear thy children cry, and send them smiles now from above, and grant them liberty. Tis thou alone can make us free, we are subjects too. Pray give us grace to bend a knee, the time we stay below. Tis unto thee we look for all, thou art our only king. Thou hast the power to save the soul and bring us flocking in. We come as sinners unto thee, we know thou hast the word. Come, blessed Jesus, make us free and bring us to our God. Although we are in slavery, we pray unto our God. He hath mercy beyond the sky, tis in his holy word. Come unto me, ye humble souls, although you live in strife. I keep alive and save the soul, and give eternal life. To all that do repent of sin, be they bond or free, I am their Savior and their King. They must come unto me. Hear the words now of the Lord. The call is loud and certain. We must be judged by his word without respect of person. Come let us seek his precepts now and love his holy word. With humble soul we'll surely bow and rate, wait the great reward. Although we came from Africa, we look unto our God to help our hearts to sigh and pray and love his holy word. Although we are in slavery, bound by the yoke of man, we must always have a single eye and do the best we can. 
Come let us join with humble voice now on the Christian shore. If we will have our only choice, tis slavery no more. Now let us not repine and say his wheels are slow. He can fill our hearts with things divine and give us freedom too. He hath the power all in his hand and all he doth is right. And if we are tied to the yoke of man, we'll pray with all might. This is the state of thousands now who are on the Christian shore. Forget the Lord to whom we bow and think of him no more. When shall we hear the joyful sound echo the Christian shore? Each humble voice with songs resound that slavery is no more. Then shall we rejoice and sing loud praises to our God. Come, sweet Jesus, heavenly King, the art, the Son of Lord. We are thy blessed children, Lord, thou still, though still in slavery. We'll seek thy precepts, love thy word, until the day we die. Come, blessed Jesus, hear us now and teach our hearts to pray and seek the Lord to whom we bow before tribunal day. Now glory be unto our God, all praise be justly given. Come seek his precepts, love his works. That is the way to heaven. The second reading is by poet laureate Amanda Gorman. This is Fury and Faith. You will be told this is not a problem, not your problem. You will be told now is not the time for change to begin, told that we cannot win. But the point of protest isn't winning, it's holding fast to the promise of freedom, even when fast victory is not promised. Meaning, we cannot stand up to police if we cannot cease policing our imagination, convincing our communities that this won't work when the work hasn't even begun, that this can wait when we've already waited out a thousand suns. By now, we understand that white supremacy and the despair it demands are as destructive as any disease. So when you're told that your rage is reactionary, remind yourself that rage is our right. It teaches us it is time to fight. In the face of injustice, not only is anger natural, but necessary, because it helps carry us to our destination. Our goal is never revenge, just restoration. Not dominance, just dignity. Not fear, just freedom, just justice. Whether we prevail is not determined by all the challenges that are present, but by all the change that is possible. And though we are unstoppable, if we ever feel we might fail, if we be fatigued and frail, when our fire can no longer be fueled by fury, we will always be fortified by this faith found in the anthem, the vow, black lives matter, no matter what. Black lives are worth living, worth defending, worth every struggle. We owe it to the fallen to fight, but we owe it to ourselves to never stay kneeling when the day calls us to stand. Together, we envision a land that is liberated, not lawless. We create a future that is free, 
not flawless. Again and again, over and over, we will stride up every mountainside, magnanimous and modest. We will be protected and served by a force that is honest, that is honored and honest. This is more than protest. It's a promise. I lived in the dorms of Volgograd State University for spring semester in 2003. Volgograd was known as Stalingrad during the Second World War. Its latitude is about the same as Northeast Ohio, which I call home. It gets cold in the winter and hot in the summer. Volgograd is not unlike other Russian cities, although it is unique in its history. Known as the site of the bloodiest battle in World War II is a gruesome fact, and it is among the bloodiest battles in the history of warfare, with an estimated two million casualties, and was a, if not the, turning point in the war in favor of the Allies. Russians take their history very seriously. In fact, I'm not sure it's possible to go anywhere in Volgograd and not find artifacts of the devastation of World War II. Buildings that had been gutted by airstrikes, bombing, firing, combat, and whatever are all over the place, standing, sometimes barely. The rubble exists as monuments to the living of the history of the place and what the people have endured. It's a beautiful city with cultivated trees and green spaces, as was Soviet custom, and public artwork on the sides of buildings and actual statues and other displays of patriotism also around. The buildings are drab in color, undistinctive, and the outsides, and especially any side that faced public streets, were very plain and unremarkable. But courtyards are often lovely, and visiting people's apartments revealed all kinds of beauty and prized items, rich in colors and content. Such things needed to be kept private, tucked away in the sanctuary of their homes, kept from prying eyes and the possible reporting of by neighbors, a consequence of not being able to trust authorities, the government, and each other. Similarly, pictures of Russians rarely show people smiling. Even years after I returned home, my roommate's pictures on social media did not show her smiling. It was a mix of superstition and culture. There were two Russian revolutions in 1917, the first of which overthrew the imperial government, and the second of which placed the Bolsheviks in power, that is, Lenin. The Soviet Union began in 1922 and ended in 1991. That less than 75 years has marked Russian culture in ways that they are still grappling with, as evidenced in part by the war they've initiated on Ukraine. Less than 75 years is enough time to do significant damage and break social and cultural traditions and understandings in ways that 30 years has been unable to undo. Imagine then what 246 years of institutional, legal, cultural, and social practices can do. The ways it can shape people, shape societies, economies, and the ways it can shape resistance, the ways it shapes imaginations. 
President Abraham Lincoln delivered the barely 700-word Emancipation Proclamation on September 22, 1862, to go into effect January 1, 1863. Even in offering freedom in the midst of a civil war, time had to be allowed for people to adjust to the idea and allow those who held enslaved people, surely, to benefit from one last harvest. Freedom arrived in stages, not at once. Slavery was not formally abolished until December 1865 and the passage of the 13th Amendment. Freedom delayed was freedom denied. For those who were enslaved in Confederate-held areas in states, not border states in the fight, not states where the Union had regained control, but the enslaved people in Confederate-held states, they waited that watch night, December 31st, 1862, and prayed and hoped that emancipation would come that morning, and it did. Arkansas, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and parts of, Georgia, of Virginia and Louisiana were included under the proclamation. But freedom for some was delayed, denied, even longer. Those enslaved in Texas were not freed, but remained enslaved until the arrival of Major General Gordon Granger in Galveston. He was there to ensure emancipation and read the orders on June 19, 1865, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. There is so much more like this, and also so little. So much of the history of black people is reduced to the litany of enslavement, after enslavement, if there has been such a thing, Jim Crow, mass incarceration statistics. Often in the period of enslavement, the 246 formal years of it, well, the history, the archives were written, kept, and curated by those in power, and records of enslaved people are almost always only to be extracted from their former owners. In other words, not their own stories told. Like when you find a book with an interesting title or cover, you can guess about what's inside, maybe read the reviews or the cover, but you don't know until you actually read it. And in this case, all we have is the title, the cover illustration, the back cover, the reviews, if that. As we can all understand, it is only reasonable to expect that this account is at best incomplete. The archives are at best thin regarding first-person narratives of those who were enslaved. That day when news broke in Galveston that the enslaved people were free, long since as it was, but free now as witnessed in public, the day was one of celebration, and the following year, commemorations were held for what has variously been called Emancipation Day, Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, and Juneteenth. Freedom from enslavement was absolutely something to rejoice about, even if it left many questions unanswered. Formerly enslaved people had no property, no money, their families had been ripped apart. And still, immediately, we see what is possible. As the web page of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture notes, quote, the post-emancipation period known as Reconstruction from 1865 to 1877 marked an era of great hope, uncertainty, and struggle for a nation as a whole. 
Formerly enslaved people immediately sought to reunify families, establish schools, run for political office, push radical legislation, and even sue slaveholders for compensation. Given the 200 plus years of enslavement, such changes were nothing short of amazing. Not even a generation out of slavery, African Americans were inspired and empowered to transform their lives and their country. With abandon, they were making a way out of no way, as later womanist theologians would say. Juneteenth began in Texas and traveled the country as formerly enslaved people migrated away. The popularity of Juneteenth as a public event ebbed and flowed over time. Not to be clear that it disappeared or wasn't necessarily recognized year after year, only that recognition as a public event or practice changed at different times. Not unlike how Russians kept that which was most important close to them, held in their families and among close friends, Black folks would also regularly celebrate Juneteenth in their families, with close friends, in their churches, sometimes in small community gatherings. For a time, this was dictated heavily by the Black Codes, which preceded Jim Crow, which also had a role, of course. This was in part out of privacy and in part because of the restrictions of Black folks in public not being permitted to be in parks, public spaces, movie theaters, amusement parks, and so on. Stories were shared and told among the celebrations, and over the years, this became an important feature of Juneteenth gatherings. Storytelling is not just a way to tell the truth or to entertain, but also to restore agency and recenter or shift the point of view of narratives. By the 1900s, a common feature of Juneteenth celebrations was to have elders come and tell their stories so that all could remember where they had come from. But I very much believe that the purpose was more than that, as if not only to tell their stories, but as a way to, to recenter the narratives told of the people who were impacted. To take what had been told only one way and present differing perspectives, to offer different understandings and experiences. Not just for the sake of giving a different view, but as a way to restore agency, to make the words, the names, the dates, into lived experiences, into the stories of their lives, to make them real. Professor Saidia Hartman at Columbia University explores these themes and ideas in her writing. For a time, Hartman, quote, had been trying to overcome the silences about black lives in the archives but she found herself reproducing them. As she once wrote, the loss of stories sharpens the hunger for them. She recounts in a New Yorker article a story of a girl who was tortured to death on a slave ship, which she tells more fully in her book, Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route. There was another girl on the ship named Venus, about whom almost nothing is written beyond her blackness and her name. Hartman finds herself haunted by Venus. Her silence screamed for curiosity. This was a person, a young woman, who had a life, and her life mattered to the people who loved her. To imagine her gone, her life and story lost to history seemed almost too much. Not least of all because it's the story heard again and again, or more honestly, the silence heard again and again. 
This is a reason that Juneteenth remains so vital in the black community. It assures black folks telling black folks stories. It values storytelling as a way of connecting the past to the present and the present to the future because we need the past to know who we have been to have an idea of where we want to go. Like the way Volgograd is a living testimony of the city's history, remembering the past is a way to fertilize ground for dreaming of the future and the possibilities of the present. And so there have been resurgences of Juneteenth celebration during the civil rights and black power movements, publicly blessed and returned to the fore in 1968 by Coretta Scott King. Texas made Juneteenth a state holiday in 1980, again placing it squarely in the public. After the Rodney King beatings and, beatings and riots, Juneteenth was celebrated again as black folks reflected on the ideas of freedom, civil rights, the value of life, with questions about black liberty and black justice denied once again. The murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others that led to the protests in 2020 also re-inspired public Juneteenth celebrations and the following year saw the holiday recognized federally. Today, Juneteenth is a moment of black freedom in public. Over time, Juneteenth has become a day that encapsulates so much of black history in the Americas, recognizing enslaver, enslavement and freedom, past and future, pain and hope, sorrow and joy, how far we have come and how very far we have yet to go, questions that lie at each of our hearts in their own ways but all live side by side. Justice for the past can only be found in our present and our future. If you are white like me, our work is not in celebrating Juneteenth, but in supporting black folks in making celebrations possible. Our work is in paying reparations that the government and corporations and others will never pay. It is a debt that cannot be repaid, but it is our work to strive for anyway. Reparations is, in fact, one of my spiritual practices, and I make payments every month to organizations that work for liberation and through personal requests. Many of these asks are mutual aid using tools like GoFundMe and Venmo, PayPal, and Cash App. Our work is to find ways to support black imaginations, creativity, excellence, futures and presence, as well as joy and rest. Our work is to find a way to live among the rubble of the people we have been, as a way to help us all dream about what may yet be. We plumb the depths of the history and where the archives give us names, dates, and locations. It is our work to tell the stories that made such lists possible. We will all remember when the stories can sink into our bones, when they are made of feelings and emotions, thoughts, sensations, experiences that we recognize in our own lives that connect us with others. We must wonder about what legacies we are living right now. As the, we face the future, are we to be those who delay and deny or those who rise and resist? May we together focus ourselves on liberation and find our way together. If you would please join me in singing our closing hymn, number 1018, in the Teal Hymnal, Come and Go With Me. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me 
me to that land Come and go with me to that land Where I'm bound, where I'm bound Come and go with me to that land Come and go with me to that land Come and go with me to that land Where I'm bound There'll be freedom in that land There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound. There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land where I'm bound. There'll be singing. In the gift of faith, Jean Harrison Nuyar has written, In the lore of ancient China, there is a story of a philosopher who was asked, Where is the road called hope? He replied, It does not exist, but as people move forward upon it, it comes into being. I invite you to continue moving forward on this path, this journey, this future called hope and freedom with me. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these we shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within this earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time to lead ourselves into the to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love we shall be known by the company we keep by the ones who circle round attend these fires we shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth it is time now it is time now that we thrive it is time we lead ourselves in to the well it is time now oh it is time now and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love in this great turning 
we shall learn to lead in love. We hope you found meaning in today's service. We extinguish the chalice with these words by Ma Maureen Killoran. We extinguish this chalice flame, daring to carry forward the vision of this free faith, that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across the earth.